Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining us today in the Congress Centre um, for our session, Putting a Price on Nature. Uh, it may be a cheeky title to make a vital point, and I'm looking forward to a range of perspectives. Um, what business needs but doesn't pay for, it perhaps tends to consume voraciously. And I was reminded this morning that the first principles of accounting were laid down in 1494. <laughs> If you look at the less tangible things that business consumes, the financial system has been learning to really quantify risk, something that it consumed in the short term but paid for only in the very longer term, maybe over the last 50 years. Today we're going to be talking all about nature and uh, different aspects and different perspectives on that. Um, we will be closed now. Um, by the Brazilian Minister of the Environment and Climate Change, uh, Minister Silva, who will join us a little later on after coming from her meetings. Um, to tee us up, uh, GDP has more than doubled in the last three decades, but natural capital has declined nearly 40% in the same time frame. With the, the briefing note started off by saying with half the world's economy, I'm going to add with all the world's population, utterly dependent on nature and its services, what do we need to do to better connect the ecology and economics, to make sure that the business systems so finely honed over centuries actually respect this up until now often free resource that is in fact extremely expensive? Um, can the value of nature be quantified as a measure of economic performance? These are the kind of questions we're going to delve into. Um, I'm asked to remind you that if you are sharing us through social channels, you should use the hashtag, hashtag WEF24. Um, and I'm sure there'll be lots of activity going on there as well. Um, I'm delighted to welcome my panelists. Um, I'm going to open up uh, with uh, Gretchen Daly, who's the co-founder and faculty director of the Stanford Natural Capital Project, deep experience in this space. Um, I am then probably, I think, going to go to, to Ron, who is the CEO of Indigo Ag and has been over the last four years, I think, um, an accomplished leadership background in technology and software as a chief executive and advisor. Um, delighted to be re welcomed also by Uyunka, who is um, a long-time leader from the Achua Nation of the Ecuadorian Amazon, serving the country's indigenous movement. He is the president of the Amazon Sacred Headwaters. And Hubert Keller, the senior managing partner at Lombard Odier, um, who has, um, is viewing nature as an asset class, um, an institution that has a chief nature officer, um, and will bring many interesting perspectives from the asset management side of this. Um, so Gretchen, you've been looking at this topic of valuing natural capital for a long time. Um, give us a bit of an overview. What are the tools, what are the ways we have to better include nature in our decision making? Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate this chance to talk together with a group that obviously cares a lot or you wouldn't be here. And um, to play off of your opening, um, I'd say first of all, we can think about two tracks that we need to navigate at the same time. One track that I'll focus on initially is just to address the crisis that we're in as quickly as we can and correct a fatal flaw with capitalism that we don't account for the immense and essentially infinite values of nature and in nature is invisible in most decision making and is now coming at a perilous price. Um, <clears throat> there's a second track, which is the much deeper shifts that we need to make um, in bringing humanity into harmony with the biosphere. And I'm really delighted that we'll also cover that dimension in this discussion. But to get to the first, the crisis, um, there's been, there is a lot of hope actually, and <clears throat> that comes through recognizing that financial systems do offer a chance to begin redressing the problem with nature being invisible in accounting and in so many types of decisions. And just to answer quickly, um, there's a new metric that's come forth called gross ecosystem product that's supported by a lot of science and data and is becoming actionable now and adopted by a suite of countries at an experimental 
initial phase. And um, we can think about gross ecosystem product, GEP, as somewhat parallel to GDP, gross domestic product. GDP is basically all the goods and services from an economy, um, where GEP is looking at all the goods and services coming from nature to people. It was um, adopted by the UN, approved the UN Statistical Commission in 2021, and um, China adopted it officially in 2022, 23, and now there are about 15 other countries that are deploying it in an experimental phase to different degrees, in spanning different world regions in Europe and Africa, across different Asian countries and in Latin America. And this is just to illustrate that we are at a point with the science and data to bring in an understanding of the vital dependence of human activities, especially in the farming sector and other activities um, on nature and in a meaningful way to account for that in our decision making. I, I like that idea very much. I do think we have spun ourselves occasionally into a difficult space where we feel there are so many different metrics. And I might come back to this topic later on, particularly with respect to guidance for individual businesses. But Ron, it's a perfect time to segue to you then. So, you know, from a business point of view, how are you integrating the valuation of nature into your business model? Yeah, it's, it's super important that you do recognize it. And we do align with that construct, construct of valuing nature. So for so long, we've taken advantage of those natural resources and not put that into our economic equation. So we do look at it and we include it in the way we look at the markets and how we're going to tie together a number of the players to bring the value chains to life as part of that overall journey. We look at several dimensions there as we look at the incentive alignment up and down the value chain. And we focus primarily at Indigo Ag, we focus on agriculture. So we're in the, in the farmlands uh, is our primary area of focus. And inside of there, we have a very uh, large value chain, a very dis diverse value chain. And to put all those pieces together, we recognize the need to put the value that we've been getting for free from those natural resources to life. One, people are willing to pay. They're willing to pay for it, but they need to understand where it's flowing, and we want to make sure that the incentives get all the way down to the farmer and make sure that the value is, is realized at the farm gate and on the farm. That incentive needs to be a durable, independent line item for the farmers to see as they go on that journey. We have to value it also accordingly beyond just what we do with carbon, because we've had a lot of conversation about carbon, but from a farmer's perspective, it's the carbon, it's the water, it's the soil. We have to put all those together in the economic equation as part of the, as part of the journey and the economic journey as we bring those pieces together. I look at what uh, uh, President Biden said. He established a $204 uh, per ton carbon social cost. When you look at that social cost, I, okay, where's the rest of it? Where's the water cost? Where's the soil? Where are all the other pieces that we have to put together? And then I'm seeing industry very interested in paying for that. We can talk about it as we go along. I'd love to actually just ask a follow-up directly on that. Um, one of the things we've seen in our management consulting work at Oliver Wyman is that the longer the supply chain, the harder it is to transmit the desire or the willingness of the consumer to pay a premium down to the person who needs to receive the premium. Correct. Uh, how are you handling that in ag? Just came from a, a meeting just now at 7 this morning talking exactly about how we bring together that whole value chain. We're all in a room together from the CPG representing the consumer all the way through to a number of us on the farmer side of it. And the, and the answer is trust and also then incentive structure and incentive alignment as part of that recognition to bring that whole journey to life. And it can be done. What we've seen practically, when we brought the premium to the farm gate, the farmer got five to eight percent more money on their scope three emissions measurements when we brought all the value down there. Our view is whoever's doing the work in the ecosystem services, that needs to get valued appropriately both in the economic cost, but also in the how we fix it as we go forward. Those premiums we're seeing for real happen out there. When we ran it all the way through the value chain, 
you know, only about two to three percent got to the farm gate. So if you add value, we have to make sure that it, you, you're adding value on that ecosystem service, not taking it as part of the journey. That's going to be the key for success in the long term to realize the economics part of it, the in the ecological part of what we have to get done. Mm -hmm. No, that makes total sense. Yunka, indigenous people protect 80% of global biodiversity. Um, and, and these business concepts you know, may also almost feel sacrilegious um, in, in some respect. How, you know, how can the way that businesses think about the value of nature better support the stewardship work that's being undertaken from the communities on the ground? First of all, I'd like to, sorry, just a second. I'd like to thank uh, the speakers and everybody here with me. And I'd like to say that we uh, should uh, speak uh, with love. Uh, we should put an end to uh, problems, tensions, and um, if I'm wrong, I'd like to apologize because sometime, sometimes I get too carried away uh, when I speak about the different uh, peoples in the Amazon and how they are trying to preserve these 35 million hectares. And I'd like to speak out of respect. First of all, we're all the children of our Mother Earth. We're spiritual brothers and sisters. This is why we should speak uh, with uh, connection, out of sincerity, and uh, creating a trust uh, when we speak about Mother Earth and uh, our ecosystem, when uh, larger companies speak about the value for us. This ecosystem is a sacred ecosystem. Uh, there's no value to it. It's invaluable. Uh, if I were to ask you, uh, with a blessing of Mother uh, Earth, if I were to ask you, I'd like to buy your mother what would be the price of your mother, for instance? There's no price, and so I'd like to listen. To, I'd like you to listen to me with the respect as I do with you. For us, the ecosystem is a living being, and there's no cost that could be assigned to it and say, let's negotiate with this. So from that point of view, uh, um, perhaps we should align ourselves and uh, to think how to create a new system in order to preserve that harmony, this well-being for all. And this is uh, where I'd like to invite you to, because uh, for now, I, there's no price that could be assigned to nature. There's no value. It's invaluable. And uh, this is why I'd rather invite you to uh, consider and to think how to align this idea, this concept of indigenous uh, uh, world of uh, natural beings and how to keep on preserving uh, together and how to make use of that nature, but out of love and with love, just as we uh, take care of our uh, Mother Earth. And that would be my uh, answer, my response. Thank you. Yonka. Gretchen, maybe I, maybe I could call on you because you made the point at the beginning about the sort of two tracks. Um, I think Yonka's points are uh, extremely important. Um, there, there are sort of different spheres of nature almost in this topic. Um, and I'd love to give you the chance to sort of respond and build on that and integrate that with your earlier idea. Yes, I, I would say, <clears throat> first off, um, the people working in this community really share both perspectives. Um, farmers, let's focus on farmers because that's where we have expertise, where so much of the action is in um, achieving the alignment in perspective. And uh, all the farmers I know, I've worked with farmers my whole life, absolutely love and revere the land. And they 
love community, they love their mother, and they see Earth as the mother in different cultures, but with that alignment. And the challenge that we all face then is how to enable farming. There's um, the vast human population and our needs, and obviously in all systems, historically we have, um, <coughs> Let me try to, I should, I need to stay on track here, sorry. Um, we have time. But I'll just say, okay, the, um, there is scope to achieve this alignment. There's, there is, this is our greatest challenge. All of civilization hinges on achieving this alignment. And so having these conversations and understanding that um, in this first phase, addressing the emergency, what we're trying to bring in is not the total value of nature. If we can accept that, that we are instead trying to send signals that drive the kinds of investments that we need in the most critical areas, like in the Amazon. The whole world depends on maintaining the Amazon. And um, <clears throat> if we can start sending those signals, we'll begin moving our complex systems in the right direction. And over time, we'll be able to refine what we're doing. And in support of that, the, um, the beauty is that a large research community has advanced the science to understand the flow of benefits from nature to people. In the past, um, we really were flying blind. We didn't have a good idea if we needed to protect water quality for drinking, for irrigation, for hydropower, for other uses. You know, where in a huge landscape where you have a lot of farming and other activity, you know, where do you protect? How much do we protect? In our world today, broadly, we need to know where and how much to protect and um, how to align activities in those areas where you're trying to achieve both protection but also production of food. <clears throat> how do you harmonize that and achieve benefits uh, that are securing nature and livelihoods? And third, how do we track progress? And that's where I'll come back to this GEP concept. It's um, designed in partnership with indigenous communities. Actually, we've been developing the Natural Capital Project, a partnership of about 500 entities, 150 in research and 350 in um, practice. <clears throat> and working together, we've developed an approach that integrates the science, showing how much nature we need for all the streams of of benefits, not just water and soil, but pollination of coffee, for example, pest control provided by bees, birds, bats. Uh, all of this system is so complex, and we're just beginning to appreciate it in a modern scientific and decision-making context. But we can start identifying those places with the science with the software that makes it accessible and actionable. All the software is now in um, Spanish and also in Chinese. We're beginning to make it more accessible in many other languages. It's adopted in 185 countries and supported by satellite imagery that lets us really sense the change in conditions in ecosystems around the planet. So, um, this has become quite actionable, and in China, in fact, the country that's gone farthest, 51% of land is now zoned for regeneration of nature, and rural people are being paid, about 200 million people, my last dis illustration, um, being paid to regenerate nature in a way that does align with the view that's um, represented by indigenous communities worldwide and, and many other local traditional communities. Thank you very much. I, I, I've been told I'm unusual. We have a notion at Oliver Wyman of love and rigor. And I'm told that I'm unusual talking about love in the sort of capitalist system and in the, in the work 
place, loving the workplace sounds wrong, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so I, I love this, this entreaty to balance love and rigor in the way that we um, uh, interact um, with natural capital. And, and Ube, Lombard Odier, I think, has been one of the most advanced investors when it comes to natural capital. You've nominated a chief nature officer. Um, I'd love to get your perspectives on how natural capital and the topics we've been talking about of valuation can, can improve investment practices, risk management practices, and lead to better outcomes. Thank you very much. And obviously, uh, wholeheartedly agree with everything that has been said, uh, particularly about the spiritual and connection with these uh, fabulous and unique nature assets. And I think one of the challenges that we have is that we have to realize the source of the problem is, you know, these nature assets are basically being eroded, destroyed, and they're being destroyed due to human activity and due to our economic activity. And then, <clears throat> so, you know, the first, I think, priority is to stop this destruction and then to basically be able to channel and deploy capital to, you know, restore them and preserve them. So, you know, we've taken the view at Lombardier that um, nature is probably going to become a very significant asset class um, and an asset in which investors, financial investors, are going to want to invest because they're going to appreciate, because the value of these assets is going to, um, is going to evolve positively over time. Um, the, the, when we think about how to unlock value into these essential nature assets today, you know, we think that there are a number of discussions and of course disclosure transparency are really going to be very helpful, but we also need to think about going at the heart of the problem. And the heart of the problem is which are the eco economic systems that are damaging nature assets today. And the good news there, there are two good news. The first one is that actually the source of the problem is very concentrated. 85% of the problem of nature that we, you know, that we inflict on nature comes from our food systems. And the other really good news is that we know today what is the better way, and it's called regenerative food production systems. Now, the question is, how can we move regenerative farming practices in a way that it creates better economics? And of course, uh, Indigo Ag knows a lot about that, but the reality is that there are places in the world, and there are commodities, food commodities, where regenerative farming practices already provide better economics. So, and when we say it provides better economics, it basically improves the quality of the nature assets. It often actually also increases the productivity of the nature assets. Um, it, and also, it creates a climate and nature premium and this is going to be a big topic, which is how can we unlock the value of that nature and that climate premium? Now, of course, the big challenge is as soon as we talk about food systems, um, as you have rightly mentioned early on, we talk about very complex value chains. And you know, one of the biggest problems is that to move from extracting nature-depleting production systems to regenerative one requires investments and required capex. And the problem is that the existing food value chains at large, the capital sits downstream and there is very, very little capital available upstream. So one of the challenge, which of course from a, from a private sector perspective we take at heart, is how do we move capital upstream? Another challenge is how do we unlock the value of these climate and nature premium? And uh, another, and the third challenge is really, you know, how do we make sure that at the end, consumers aren't necessarily going to pay for it? And the good news with food systems is the value chain is so large. And, you know, I have to be a little bit careful with what I say, but it's, it's quite ready and ripe for some element of disruption which is exactly what Tesla did, by the way, in electrical vehicles. So, you know, I'm quite positive, and, uh, you know, we indeed believe that this, this is going to be a very interesting area to deploy capital, and, you know, we have several examples. Maybe, maybe Ron, before I come back to you to, to think about that, um, we'll be having our coffee before the session, and, and you raised the coffee example. I'd love just to give you the chance to expand on that. Oh, coffee is... Um, Co coffee is, is, is really interesting because, you know, you have the, the nature dimension of coffee and then you have the economics of coffee or the value chain uh, side of coffee. On the nature side, 
basically, the coffee that we all drink um, emits between 15 and 20 tons of CO2 per ton of coffee. So we should all know that this is every time we drink coffee, we are basically putting CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, the other, and one of the reasons is because most of the coffee plantation, or most of the coffee is produced through monoculture, and, um, and, and monoculture is also affected by climate change. Um, the quality of these nature assets is uh, deteriorating quite rapidly, and uh, coffee plantation, as you all know, is mostly in global south, and you know that better than I, and, um, and, these, and this is where some of these um, uh, nature assets, these essential nature assets really lie. So there is a, you know, there is a, a great nature opportunity around coffee. If we move on to the economics of coffee, it's a roughly a 250 billion market globally. But what is really interesting is that less than 10% of this value goes to the growers. So again, we have this perfect demonstration of the, frankly, nonsensical aspect of the value chain. We need to completely sort out the upstream side of coffee, the growing and the production of coffee, and yet 90% or more of the value sits downstream in the value chain. And by the way, um, coffee grower is not, um, is, is a, you know, most of coffee growers live below the poverty line, and it's an incredibly fragmented um, uh, industry where effectively, uh, on average, a coffee grower sort of farms on average a little bit more than one hectare. So it's, it's very, very, it's very tiny. Now, the opportunity is to basically bring capital for return in <coughs> this value chain to basically you know, acquire or lease these uh, production, uh, these uh, coffee assets, these monoculture coffee assets, to transform them into regenerative agroforestry model. In doing so, we would create effectively a climate and a nature premium, which will have a lot of value for these parts of the value chain that can inset these uh, climate and the nature premium. And you end up with basically coffee plantation that are fully regenerative, that are sequestering carbon, that are positive for nature, that are restoring biodiversity, and that basically are um, you know, creating better value for an asset that has a longer life without actually the consumer paying any more for its daily coffee. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Ron for your responses on that theme. We'll have time for a couple of questions um, before I hand over to the Minister, so get your thoughts ready. But Sure, um, to, to build on all three threads, they, they all tie together. Uh, nature, uh, our journey to regenerative agriculture or uh, agriculture itself is really a trip back to the future, right? We're, we're actually looking historically at how we did all these practices, and we're just bringing them back to life in a more uh, organized and uh, in an organized manner to feed the planet. But that's the key here. And building on what Hubert was saying, he's 100% correct in the way to think about the assets and the, and the flow of that farmer's journey. So let's just stay on the farm. Please move to regenerative farming. It's hyper-local. Everything happens in that local region, from the microbes that sit in the soil, all the way through to the economics and the advice that happens for that farmer to go on that regenerative journey. And that regenerative journey around the globe, as we've studied at Indigo Ag, what we've seen is the whole range is out there. We have people who are already there, regenerative farmers, uh, that, you know, I just was on farm, one farm and they were sharing with me that they've already added a 16th of an inch of new soil. With great pride, they took that they gave back to nature what, what they had taken, their, their parents had stripped away, right? So very exciting to see this transformation begin to happen. That happened over eight years, that farmer measured it. So it's very exciting to see those transitions. To the other extreme, where you have, uh, where you have hey, well, they're still doing current uh, monocropping uh, as, as part of their journey, which is ripping down the soil. So let's translate that to economics now. What we're seeing from an overall perspective is we're actually seeing premiums get down to the farms. And when we see the premiums get in that 5 to 10% range at the farm gate, what we actually see is the farmers moving towards that. What we need is the length of the contracts to be longer. We need to be able to address the crop rotations that we need to naturally do. 
And then we want to make sure that the value chain gets paid along the way for which pieces happen at that point of impact. I totally agree with Hubert. These things should be viewed as nature credits over time. We've started with carbon credits. We've seen that. It should mostly be in the food industry. It'll be about 80% scope three insets, and the other 20 will be probably in some form of an offset. They're both regenerative practices. That's what matters. The economic system that you referenced, Gretchen, is at the epicenter of being able to bring that to life so we measure it appropriately and re represent value there. Now, why is it so important, that 5 to 10% premium on the insets? If I take examples that we've done of rice in the U.S. and in India, it was less than half a cent per pound at the consumer. We can afford to make this change. It's all here. It's just organizing the systems of incentives to get it as close to the farmer. We're all starting at the top of the supply chain, the consumers. We actually have to start down at the farm gate. And everything Uber was saying, I'm 100% aligned with because that's where it's gonna make the difference and we can create the investments the right way. Those assets will grow and we'll fix the planet. Can I just add one yeah, element, which briefly. I think is really important that we, we all really understand. The, um, the decarbonization strategy of the big food consumer company goes through insetting. Insetting is basically the, the only way for them of reducing their SOAP3 emission. And again, going back to what you were saying, that's why there is pricing space in the value chain. The trick is a durable incentive system. So for me, durability is longevity, the, le the length of it, the measurements that go with it for the sustainable outcomes that need to happen so that we return nature to what she's capable of doing. We only have to add the gas, the water, and the soil, and Mother Nature knows what she's doing. She'll take care of all the rest. All the ingredients are right there for her to be as successful as she was before we all showed up and taking advantage of her. Thank you very much. Do we have, do we have the minister? Okay, well, that's, we'll keep talking. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me turn it over to the audience for any, any questions you may have for our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, uh, how far we are from having such a practical system in which every step of the value chain can get the incentive to incorporate the additional costs and mobilize CAPEX towards the upstream from the one that pays, which is the final consumer. How, how far we are, and hopefully we may have such a high nature premium that satisfied uh, the leaders of the indigenous communities. Uh, gracias por su inspiración. So I, I suppose uh, we've made the case that it sort of exists, so the question would be at scale. <coughs> <laughs> Who wants to take that? Um, okay. Okay. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'll I'll I mean, I, I have a very si si simple and perhaps uh, naive view on the coffee value chain. I think they will, I, I think, you know, the move towards regenerative coffee will also require some profound change in the value chain because there is simply too many actors that sort of take margins in between um, for the economics to work. So we're going to see more uh, end market integration to make this work and for the consumer to not be affected. I'll build on what Hubert said. Uh, he said it much more directly. We got to get the money as this travels through the system at the farm gate. And, and I, I, I am a big believer in that. That's what Indigo Ag is focused on. Just building on top of your question, where are the real live examples? So let me share one that we announced at COP28. We got together as part of WEF and we created something called the First Movers Coalition. We've gotten together a number of the companies together in the industry crossing multiple consumer packaged good companies, trading houses, right through the production players, and all of us have now committed to go 
in one motion is in unison to begin to address this problem and bring the demand signals together mm -hmm. to get that down to the meeting to to the farmer to the farm gate the meeting i was at this morning was with that group and we were having that exact conversation so it is happening we've committed to move 30 billion dollars of demand over to that space and then on the fa fiber side there's the fashion pack which is now agreed to pull together it's over 20 companies on the cotton side to address the thing in the same way so these these things are now starting to happen in the, in the right manner. And I'll just um, close while we're w letting the minister get ready, um, <clears throat> saying that at a higher level, if we look across other sectors in, um, beyond those mentioned here in agriculture and, and globally, we um, see a m big movement. There's support from the multilateral development banks to help drive these shifts and help make some of the policy landscape align more with this vision by changing and getting rid of really harmful subsidies. Uh, so much of the subsidy system is actually driving the, the Un problem. Unintended con consequences of some right. of the subsidies. But we are seeing major um, advances and much more attention to this with um, leaders in, for example, the development community trying to um, work more as a system across different banks, adopting this natural capital accounting and approaches for planning and aligning policy and incentives with the vision represented most eloquently and powerfully by indigenous communities. Thank you very much. Before I hand to the Minister Juncker, I, I would like to give you the last word of the panel. Given everything you've heard, what is your appeal to, to us? How can we make your life easier? Well, little by little, we are aligning our views. This is very interesting. Yesterday, I was saying that we still have hope Hope lives within us, in youth, in women, in men, in entrepreneurs. When you talk about bonuses, well, let me take, for example, the coffee. For us indigenous peoples, all monocrop products at a large scale are negative. Soy, for example, it's not, on, not only about coffee. We can talk about soy, palm oil, cocoa and other products that are intensively produced, and all of them are negative. Well, first of all, excuse me, uh, Minister, for uh, taking your time, but let me tell you something. For indigenous cultures, the worst thing would be monocrops. The, m the most important thing is uh, to diversify uh, crops. That's the way we've been exp uh, exploiting our territories. Today, there are new products on the global market, and one of them comes, comes from the Amazonian forest. I'm talking about vanilla. Vanilla that has been used by us, indigenous people, with a lot of knowledge and following our traditions. But we should encourage the global banks to give us access to new possibilities because the situation has been so difficult for indigenous peoples that we need solutions. Who has been uh, providing bonuses in order to support the, ex the ecosystem? Nobody has been doing that. I've been working in this environment for 30 years and I have never seen a bonuses to be granted. All of our leaders are working for free. Nobody's making money. And we don't have jobs either. Why? Because our Mother Earth is our main provider. However, another system has been created. For example, an educational system. You need to go to college. So, which is, and, and this situation is very different from what we know. We do not have to go to cities to receive a certain education. So it would be great 
if banks and people with good hearts open this possibility to us so that we can keep preserving our forest, but keep, but also keep saving the life of the whole mankind. That's what we want. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thank you very much indeed. And, um, and so I, I think bang on the time budget, uh, it turns to me to welcome Marina Silva, the Minister of Environment and Climate Change of Brazil. Uh, more than 40 years of uh, campaigning and policy work and uh, much awarded and recognized for your work. Thank you very much for joining us. Please share your perspectives. Should we sit should down? I, should I? Yeah, let's, let's give the stage to the minister. <laughs> Bem, é, que bom ainda foi possível é, ouvir é, a fala daquele que representa as populações originárias, é, os povos indígenas e a, as populações tradicionais que aprenderam muito com os povos indígenas. Uh, good morning. It's good that I have, I'm, I'm honored to be here and good that I had the chance also to listen to a representative of indigenous communities and those who have learned with their uh, millennial uh, knowledge. When I was made a invite to see if it's possible to put a price on nature, of course, it causes, in the first moment, a strange feeling. Num segundo momento, é, se a gente talvez, em vez de falar a palavra preço, fala a palavra valor, <risos> é, cria um conforto maior. Uh, so I, I was, when I was first invited to this panel and I, and I read the title, putting a price on, on nature, I believe this first causes us some sort of a, 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 a strange feeling. But as, as soon as we, you know, we have a, a deeper look into it and if we consider the, the aspect of value instead of price, then we may be in the, in the right direction. A palavra valor para mim remete a algo que vai além daquilo que podemos precificar porque a natureza ela tem valores que muitas vezes a forma e o estágio em que nos encontramos ainda não conseguiu alcançar esse valor e em algum momento mais à frente a gente vai descobrir que tem é, um valor que talvez até possa ser precificado é. The idea of value, I, I believe, conveys a, a, a larger a significance than, than pricing, because in the, there are forms uh, of, of, of providing uh, that nature provides values which may be currently not uh, reflected in, in, in pricing systems, but at some point further down the road, we, they might be, be valued, as, they might be um, signified in, in prices. O, agora no G20, o Brasil vai é, trabalhar uma força-tarefa sobre serviços ecossistêmicos. É, enfim, o, o, a ideia de um pagamento por serviços ecossistêmicos e como preservar os serviços ecossistêmicos que são fundamentais para o planeta. Um, in, during the Brazilian presidency of G20, one of the topics that will be uh, prioritized is payment for ecosystem services. The idea of how do we how do we frame it and how do, do we use this mechanism to contribute to conservation? Eu tenho um exemplo que eu gosto de citar. A Amazônia produz 20 bilhões de toneladas de água por dia. 
50% dessa água a floresta usa, 50% é dispersada na atmosfera, que é responsável pelo nosso regime de chuvas, é, ao qual está relacionado 75% do PIB da América do Sul. So I have one example, for instance, the, the Amazon basin is, uh, through evaporation is responsible for 20 million tons of water per day. And this uh, is a, a major significance for our, our rain patterns. And this, in turn, uh, is uh, directly uh, linked to 75% of the GDP of South America. São os chamados rios voadores. They are called the flying rivers. É, se fôssemos bombear essa água, nós precisaríamos de 50 mil Itaipus, que é uma grande hidrelétrica binacional é, que envolve dois países, inclusive o meu país. If we were to, to pump all, all, all of this water, we would need 50,000 Itaipu power dams, which is one of the largest uh, hydro dams in the world in, 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 in the border between Brazil and Paraguay. Alguém consegue imaginar um investimento como esse, 50 é, mil Itaipus bombeando água ininterruptamente para poder alimentar o nosso regime hidrológico? Yeah, could someone imagine uh, how much capital would we need in investment to, to provide this, this service? Mas a natureza faz isso é, apenas utilizando a terra, seus nutrientes, a floresta, o sol e o vento. Yeah, but nature do it, does it using only you know, soil, nutrients, sun and wind. É um serviço ecossistêmico incalculável. It's an in, 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 incalculable uh, ecosystem service. É, por isso é muito importante esse debate sobre o valor da natureza. This is why it's very important this debate on the value of nature. É, a Hannah Arendt diz que nós só podemos perdoar aquilo que nós podemos punir. Uh, Hannah Hannah used to say that we can only forgive those things that we can punish. Parafraseando é, Hannah Arendt, eu diria que talvez a gente só consiga precificar aquilo que a gente pode produzir. So maybe a paraphrase in Hannah Arendt, maybe we can only put a price on those things that we can produce. Aquilo que a natureza é em si mesmo, ontologicamente, talvez a gente só consiga ver o valor. Those things uh, where the value uh, of nature is ontologic into itself, maybe we can only see the value. Um valor que tem preço também. A, a value which may also have a price. Sobre pre sobretudo o preço de quem pesquisa. Above all, the, the price of those who research. O preço de quem usufrui desses serviços ecossistêmicos. The price for those who, who benefit from these ecosystem services. E dos conhecimentos milenares daqueles que têm conhecimentos associados a esses recursos. And, and the price of the uh, millennial knowledge of those who have a knowledge associated to these resources. Muito obrigada pela oportunidade de poder participar desse debate. Thank you very much for the opportunity for participating in this debate. E que ele seja constante nesse olhar para a natureza. And, and I hope that it will, will be a, a constant one in this debate uh, uh, as we look into nature. E que essa imagem linda and that this beautiful image da neve aqui possa permanecer can, porque é um serviço ecossistêmico cultural muito as, obrigado as a cultural ecosystem service <laughs> thank you very much